When I was around 10 years old, my sister, who was maybe 13 or 14, had a friend who came to our house and stayed overnight. I spent a little time with these two girls, and my sister's friend said a word I had never heard. In fact, she said it several times, and she seemed to feel she was very clever and a little bit naughty for saying it. I had no idea what that word meant, but a day or two I said the word in the presence of my parents, and from their reaction you would think I had slapped them on the face. They were shocked to hear this word, which turned out to be the mother of all curse words coming from my ten-year-old lips, and they immediately told me I was never to say such a word. Now, they didn't tell me what the word meant, and it was left to my imagination to figure that out, but one thing I was sure of, this was a word that should never be spoken, at least not when adults were present. In the world of metabolic syndrome and diabetes reversal, there is a word that is likewise considered a terrible, evil curse word that refers to foods that must never be eaten or even considered. If these types of foods even touch your plate, you're headed for disaster. You will surely soon have a heart attack, get diabetes, become enormously obese, have high blood pressure, and come to a terrible and painful end. Among many nutritionists, this word has become cool and very popular to say, but you must always say it with a frown and a scowl on your face as though you were contemplating the most disgusting stinking, putrefying excuse for food that humankind has ever produced. So what is this monstrous word? Well, it actually started out as the word processed, but after a while it morphed into the word ultra-processed. If you read books or watch videos by nutritionists on either side of the aisle, either plant-based or low-carb meat-eaters, the one type of food that nearly everybody agrees represents the epitome of evil is ultra-processed food. Many folks will never tell you to slash the carbohydrates in your diet. In their minds, if you can just slash the processed foods and eat real food, you will be fine. Avoid the inner parts of your grocery store and stick with the produce section, and if you need meat or eggs, get those that are minimally processed. Now, I will admit that they're close to being correct, but simply choosing unprocessed foods is not the whole story. Keep in mind that, in my case, I beat diabetes primarily by focusing on my glucose levels, testing them about an hour after eating various meals. If my blood sugar rise stayed under 140, I was satisfied and considered that a meal or a food that was safe for me. If it rose above 140, I eliminated that meal or food or else modified it. And I quickly discovered that one fairly accurate guide to predicting how high a food would spike my glucose was simply the number of carbohydrates it contained. In nearly all cases, if my meal contained less than 20 grams of carbs, it hardly mattered what I ate. I would not spike very high. It didn't matter whether I was eating fried chicken or a salad, whether I was eating at McDonald's or steak and ale. If my meal just had a few carbs, my glucose meter would reveal that I did not get a major glucose spike. Nor did it matter whether the food was processed or unprocessed. An unprocessed potato spiked my glucose far higher than a highly processed bowl of keto cereal. And because I was so laser-focused on low glucose rises, I did not pay much attention to the idea of ultra-processed versus barely processed versus unprocessed. Today, many nutritionists seem to believe that as long as we eat unprocessed foods, we have nothing to worry about. In their minds, if your food comes fresh from the field or your meat comes from a cow or pig or goat that you raised in your own backyard— everything will be just fine. Now, I will acknowledge that if the average person eliminated all processed foods from their diet, their glucose levels and their insulin levels would probably improve. But the, the reason for this is due to the fact that most processed foods are high-carb foods. If you look at the vast amount of processed foods in your grocery store, most of them are carbs. The pretzels, the chips, the breakfast cereal, the donuts, all the breads, pizza, ice cream, candy, cakes, pies, all of these are both highly processed 
and very high in carbohydrates. So yeah, absolutely, if you eliminate all processed foods, you will almost certainly end up eating far less carbs than you previously did, and your blood sugar levels and your A1C should improve, unless you decide to go on a diet of unprocessed potatoes, unprocessed bananas, mangoes, dates, and quinoa. If you try to eat those highly unprocessed foods, you're going to find that your blood sugar will go up instead of down. The point I'm making is that when we focus exclusively on processed or ultra-processed versus unprocessed, we're not really seeing things completely clearly. In the United States politics, especially presidential politics, there's a saying, it's the economy, stupid. The idea is that whichever candidate who can convince people that he or she will be a positive influence on the nation's economy will probably win the election. And likewise, in the world of overcoming diabetes and its many terrible complications, the ultimate reality is this. It's the carbohydrates. I won't say stupid, but it is the carbohydrates. Carbohydrates provoke both high glucose spikes and high insulin surges, the evil twin brothers that turn us into diabetics, or if we're already diabetic, they make us worse and worse diabetics with soaring A1Cs. And when we focus exclusively on processed versus unprocessed and entirely neglect the issue of carbohydrates, we're not exactly doing ourselves any favor. And to prove this point, I'm going to eat a most unusual lunch, a meal I've never eaten before, at least in these portions, and I'll probably never eat again. And here it is. I'm going to eat two hot dogs, no buns, and two slices of thick bologna. Again, no bread involved, so just basically meat. Now, these are both processed meat. These hot dog buns aren't little critters that run around and somebody just killed them and cut them into steaks. They were processed and mixed with different things, and there were chemicals added. So, not the ideal food. And likewise, the same is true with bologna. Processed bologna, not, <laughs> nothing too natural about it, but they're meat, and they're fairly low carb. Now, they're not ideal by any means, not only because they're highly processed, but because they've added sugar. So, these are uh, these hot dogs have four grams of sugar each, so that's eight, and then the bologna has two grams per slice, so that's 12 altogether. So it's not like I'm getting zero carbs, but I'm pretty sure, based on my years of experience of testing glucose, that uh, they're not going to spike my blood sugar much. So we are going to check it out, and uh, I will eat this for my lunch and come back at about an hour and 15 minutes and see uh, how high my glucose spiked. I'm going to put some mustard on the hot dogs because I like mustard with my hot dogs. And guess what? Mustard uh, has no carbs to it. Actually, zero. At least it should be. Yeah, zero carbs. So it, it's, it's like the good twin, whereas ketchup is the bad twin. Ketchup's got a lot of sugar. Mustard has none. So mustard on the hot dogs. Bologna, I'll just eat as bologna. And uh, not exactly a natural meal by any means, but will it raise my blood sugar? Well, give me a little time and I'll come back and let you know. It has been around an hour and 15 minutes since I finished that meal of two hot dogs, no buns, and two slices of thick bologna. And now we're going to see what kind of blood sugar rise I get. Uh, before the meal, I registered a 96. How high will it go? 12 total grams of carbs in that meal, uh, almost no fiber at all. So we will see exactly what's going on with the blood sugar rise from processed meat. Processed meat. <laughs> yes, I said it. Processed meat. Okay, a 126. Now that's higher than I thought, but keep in mind there was sugar in those hot dogs and there was sugar in that bologna. But we're going to compare that to what I get with unprocessed high carb foods. Okay, here are a few quick thoughts. First, I wasn't really happy with the results of that meal of hot dogs and bologna. 
At 126, my blood sugar was within range, but considering that all I ate was meat, that was pretty high. A couple of weeks ago, I ate Benedicta's bean and vegetable soup with a piece of cheese, and when I tested my glucose to determine my peak, my post-meal glucose was only 111. So my counsel is, if you're going to eat hot dogs, find some that are sugar-free if possible. On the other hand, high-carb, unprocessed foods spike my glucose far higher than this meal of hot dogs and bologna, even with some added sugar. When I tested one white potato all by itself in one of my Beat Diabetes videos, I spiked up to 195. A sweet potato with a side of quinoa spiked me up to 172 at about an hour after eating, and it continued to raise my glucose until it was at 187, at two hours post-meal. In another test for this channel, I compared a sweet potato by itself versus a sweet potato drenched with butter and loaded with bacon. In both cases, the result was terrible. The sweet potato by itself spiked me up to 201 at one hour post-meal, and the sweet potato with butter and bacon sent me to 187. The moral of the story is that natural is not always good, especially for someone who has crossed the boundary into diabetes, even if he or she has made his way back and is getting excellent glucose numbers and A1C test scores. And speaking of sweet potatoes, they are two things. First, they are totally unprocessed. And second, they are terrible glucose spikers only exceeded by white potatoes. If someone promised me a million dollars for eating only sugar-free hot dogs for the next six months or eating only sweet potatoes or white potatoes for that amount of time, I would go for the hot dogs. Now, we're all after the same thing, folks. We want to live a healthy life. We want to live to an old age and we want to pass away peacefully at the conclusion of our healthy, long life with our limbs, kidneys, and the rest of our bodies intact. And research is telling us that our number one enemy that can easily block us from this goal is metabolic syndrome, high glucose and surging insulin levels, or hyperinsulinemia, as it is called. The one marker above every other marker that indicates that a heart attack, a stroke, kidney failure, or a failing pancreas is in your near future is high glucose levels and outrageous glucose spikes after your meals. As far as I'm concerned, avoiding high glucose and big glucose spikes is my number one priority as relates to my health. Yes, it's good to eat nutritious meals. It's a worthy goal to eat natural, real food and avoid processed foods as much as is reasonably possible. But trumping all those things is the absolute necessity of taming our soaring glucose and those terrible post-meal glucose spikes. And this means that we cannot simply assume that as long as we eat unprocessed foods, we're just fine. Low-carb meals and time-restricted eating trump every other nutritional approach. They trump how many vitamins and nutrients you're taking. They trump whether your meat is fresh off the farm or came from a meat plant. They trump whether your buddies are going to pat you on the back for being environmentally sensitive. They trump whether you're eating lots of fruit. They trump whether you're getting enough fish oil and every other consideration. First, Crush the bully of diabetes and those soaring glucose levels and surging insulin. And then you can start thinking about nutrition and avoiding highly processed foods and all the rest. You may have noticed a different kind of thumbnail from my Bible teaching channel. In addition to my Devo thumbnails and Ben and my table Bible study thumbnails, there's now a new thumbnail you'll see that looks like this. And when you click on this type of thumbnail, you'll find there's no video. You're simply hearing an audio Bible study with Ben and me while staring at a still picture. Now, if you're wondering why there's no video to go with the audio, it's because this is an audio-only podcast. So no, there's no video to watch, but what this means is that you can listen to these audio Bible studies while you go for a walk, drive your car, or prepare dinner in your kitchen. 
So check out these audio podcasts on our Bible teaching channel, which goes by my name, Dennis Pollock.